very excited about it because I believe the healing balm of Gilead is present here today to heal the sick. And uh, so I'm going to go right into this. I'm in a series on Jesus. We started last week, Jesus the Savior. This week, it's Jesus the Healer. Everybody shout, Jesus the Healer. Jesus the Healer. Amen. Jesus the Healer. One more thing. as If, if you want, you can just uh, very quickly stand to your feet, and we'll read the scriptures together. It'll be on the screens. Uh, Psalm 103, 1 through 5 is kind of our main passage. We are working on getting uh, the baptismal fixed up and where it needs to be. It is sitting right back there to dry rot it. We can't use the one there. But we're working on some solutions. And uh, I'm going to do water baptism. I'm intending to do it the first Sunday of every month all year um, because I believe we're going to have a need for baptizing people in water every Sunday, uh, first Sundays uh, of the month for the year. And I know we've got several people recently saved that would like to be baptized. So having said that, we're working on that. Psalm 103, 1 through 5 in the English Standard Version, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity. That's Jesus the Savior. Who heals all your diseases. That's today. Jesus the healer, or Jehovah Rapha. Who redeems your life from the pit. That is Jehovah Nisi, our protector, our deliverer. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. That's Jehovah Shammah, or uh, Jesus uh, the Christ in us, the Holy Spirit within us. Who satisfies you with good. That's Jehovah Jireh, our provider, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. All right, let's go right into Matthew 8, 1 through 4. And this is going to be the text I'm preaching from. And I want you to really follow me today because God's got a word for you today. Poke your neighbor and say, God's got a word for you today. When he had come down from the mountain, Jesus, just following preaching the Sermon on the Mount, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He just believed Jesus could do it. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful, Lord, for your grace and for your glory and for your mercy. I'm asking you right now, God, that you would just touch this service and anoint it in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father God, your mighty hand be with us. I'm asking you, God, to anoint me to speak forth your word, not in word and tongue only, but also in power and in might. I pray, Lord Jesus, let the good soul of the, uh, the let the word fall in the good soul of our hearts and grow and bear forth fruit in our lives. Anoint me, God, even if it's in spite of me. But I pray your word go forth, God, and it do what it's intended to do. And God, I thank you that this is a house of miracles, and we will see the mighty hand of God work today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hold your Bibles up in whatever form you have, and let's boldly declare, Father, Father today, today, this week, this week by your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word, and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. High five two or three people as you're being seated and say, you've come to the right house today. Tell them you're going to get healed today. Two months ago, not years ago, March 2nd, he healed me. I went into Good Sam Hospital for a several, several biopsies on a lump that was in a mammogram. It was told, I was told it was complicated. I was told there was a moderate chance it was malignant. So I walked in. I'm sitting there. I said, can I see it? So she showed it to me, this big, massive-looking black object. And they started the biopsy. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking, and I'm like, Doc, this was on the second biopsy, I said, is it changing? And the radiologist goes, no. She goes, that's the sonogram. That's the way it looks. He paused a moment. He goes, no, it's changing. So went through the whole thing. At the fifth one, he stands up. He goes, Brenda, you're done. He goes, you can leave. She goes, stick around, Brenda. You have to have a mammogram now. He goes, no, she doesn't. It's gone. No, 
I have to tell you, when I went in there, I was thinking, it's going to be gone. I'm not going to have to go through this pain. I'm not going to have to do this. But sitting in Good Salem right now are pictures of a biopsy of what was supposed to be cancer as it disappeared. And the doctor who stood there just amazed at the God that we serve, a God who heals today. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah! Is God still a healer? Yes. <laughs> now in our text in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, it's interesting, Jesus has just preached the Sermon on the Mount. He is one of the most just um, messages that seem like just a rabbit trail here and a rabbit trail, no continuity to it whatsoever. It just seems like there's just thoughts out there just floating around everywhere. It's one of the greatest sermons ever. And as you, he finishes this, he's coming down the mountain on his way out. Multitudes are following him. And up comes this leper out of nowhere running to Jesus. Now, you have to understand that Jesus, Jewish law, excuse me, banished him. He was banished from society. He couldn't come near anyone in his community. Lepers were the most defiled and the most unclean people in society. No one wanted anything to do with them. No one wanted, anyone wanted them to get anywhere near them. And uh, as a matter of fact, they would have to cry from the loud, far off. And they would many times have a bell. They would ring, unclean, unclean. And they would do that because from far away, they might look like the average person and look like things are well. But when you got close, you could find that they had a problem. They had a serious condition that you wanted no part of. From the outside far away, things looked great. But on the inside, they were dying of a skin-eating disease that was going to kill them with the most gruesome of deaths. And I come to preach to somebody today because there are people that come into church every Sunday, and from far away on the outside, they look good. They got their fancy suits on and their nice dresses and all whatever their good Sunday clothes are or however they come in the building. They put a smile on. They shake your hand at the door and they say, good to see you, brother. Everything is well. But on the inside, they have a, a skin-eating disease, so to speak. Symbolically, they have a soul-eating disease called sin. From the outside, you have a smile, but on the inside, you're filled with bitterness and hatred. While you smile and put a front on on a Sunday morning, that bitterness is raving inside of you and eating you out from the inside out. Grief-stricken, maybe you're terrorized with fear. Maybe you're nauseous with anxiety. Maybe you're overflowing with hurt and wounds, riddled with rejection, sick, possibly diseased. The list could go on and on and on. And while you smile and do your work on, on Monday through Friday and your coworkers think everything is well, you know deep down inside what's really going on. Your spouse may not even realize, your children or your parents may not even realize what's going on, but deep down inside, there's something eating you up. And perhaps it is sin. Leprosy was a disease under the skin that ate the skin away until, it, until they died the most gruesome of deaths. And the only thing that could be done for leprosy was to burn it up. There was no other answer for it. And I want to tell you that sin beneath the exterior will eat your life away until there's nothing left. Sin will eat your peace away and leave you with nothing but anxiety. Sin will eat your faith away and leave you with nothing but fear. Sin will eat your hope away and leave you lifeless. Am I preaching to anybody? Sin is an incurable unfixable and deadly problem that you and I cannot fix on our own. But there is one that can fix it, and only one. And his name is Jesus Christ. This man had an, uh, an incurable and an unfixable problem that he had nothing he could do about it. Doctors couldn't help him. Society couldn't help him. So what did he do? He went to the only one he felt like could help, and that was Jesus Christ. I got a question for you today just as we're starting this message off. Do you have an un unfixable and an uncurable problem that you're faced with? 
Do you have some kind of sickness or disease that the doctors tell you it doesn't look good to you? Do you have some kind of issue in your life that you can't solve? Do you have some kind of sin in your life that you need freedom from? We all have problems. How many of you have problems that you're faced with, right? We all deal with something. The fact that you haven't fixed it means you can't fix it. So you have but no choice but to come to Jesus at the cross and, and give it to him. And that's the first thing I want you to notice about this man. He went to Jesus. He got up, got enough grace and muster and luster and fortitude to get out of his cave or wherever he was hiding and run to Jesus. Look what Matthew 8, 2 says. I love it. And behold, a leper, what's the next word say? He came. It's just that simple. This demonstrates that no one is too unclean. There's no one too polluted. There's no one too dirty. And there's no one so sinful that you can't run to Jesus Christ. Woo, somebody shout yeah. amen. That leper was totally unclean. And I want, to, I want you to hear this. He didn't try to clean himself up first. He didn't try to mask his problem. He just took him and all his glory and all his problems and all his mess, and he ran to Jesus. If you're in the sound of my voice and you think, well, if I just get this area of my life right, then I'll start going to church. If I start getting this area right, then I'll run to Jesus. That's not how it works. You will never get that area right. What you need to do is take you you in all your mess and just run to Jesus. Somebody shout amen. And when you come to Jesus, this leads me to my first point, you simply ask Jesus to heal you. Everybody say ask him to heal you. Look what Matthew 8, 2 says. Behold, a leper came and worshipped him and saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. All you need for your miracle is to ask Jesus to do it. Amen. All you need for your miracle is to believe Jesus will do it. Yeah. I want to set something up right now to begin this message. There is, there is uh, sickness and disease has not come from God. Right. First John 3, 8, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Well, what's some of those works? Well, let's just look and see if the Bible declares what it is. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, watch this, and healing all who were oppressed by who? Yeah. The devil. For God was with him. I want to tell you, you can be a spirit-filled Christian and be oppressed by the devil at the same time. Just because you're spirit-filled don't mean the devil's not going to come attack you. He did Jesus right. in the wilderness. What makes us think he won't come attack us too? Luke 13, 11 spells it out even better. There was a woman who was, for 18 years, had an illness caused by a spirit or a demon. demon. She was bent double and could not straighten up at all. Luke 13, 16, same story. Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, being a child of God, whom Satan, everybody say Satan, Satan. has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day who bound her? Sickness and disease is from the devil. It is not from God. I want you to catch that. God does not give anyone sickness. God does not give anyone disease. It is straight from the pit of hell. In an effort to help some understand, some will say, well, you know, I ain't got my healing yet, but sickness and disease, you know, it's going to bring glory to God. I, I have a question. Really? How does you being sick or diseased bring God any glory? I'll tell you what brings God glory. When you hear a testimony like Brenda's, and she says, the doctor said, you've been healed. It's gone. Somebody say amen. Or here's another one. Well, God's teaching, God's teaching you something through this. I've got a question. For those of you that are parents, how many of you would give your kid cancer to teach him something? How many would say, you know what, I'm just going to let you have a little leprosy and let you learn a little something? Now, if you grew up where I grew up, you might get a belt on the hiney, but they're not going to put a life-altering cancer on you or some kind of sickness on you. God does not give you sickness or disease to teach you something. He's very capable of teaching you without that mess. Why would God give you something that Jesus took 39 stripes on his body to be healed from? If God was going to give it, why did Jesus pay the price for the healing? 
God didn't give it, the devil did, but I'm here to tell you Jesus can heal it. And I want you to notice something else that I, I studied. I really studied this, and I just, I was blown away at what I learned here. G listen, this man, we would think this man said, hey, I want to be healed. Because blind Barnabas, when Jesus said, what, what was the deal with you? He said, well, I, that I may receive my sight. So we think sometimes, well, he must have asked to be healed. Oh, God, you know, if you're willing, you can heal me. That's not what it says. It says, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. In the original Greek, the word cleanse means to be clean. Watch, I'm going somewhere. Free from physical stains. Free from defilement and from faults. That ain't got nothing to do with leprosy. Free from guilt. That has nothing to do from leprosy. You know what this man was saying? I got a real problem on the outside, but first and foremost, I got a problem on the inside. I'm defiled with faults and sin and things that are not right. Jesus, I do want you to heal me of leprosy, but I got to get healed on the inside as well. Man, somebody's going to get set free to here today. He wasn't just asking Jesus to heal him. He was asking Jesus for total restoration. He was saying, God, my life is a total and complete mess. Can you cleanse me? Can you put me back together again? Can you totally restore all areas of my life? And I'm here to tell you that Jesus can heal you. He can restore you. He can totally restore everything in your life right here, right now, today. What would your life be like if you left totally restored today? What would your family be like? You'd walk into work Monday and they'd say, what in the world got into you? While everybody else ran from this man, Jesus decided to get close to him. Mm, I'm going somewhere else. Everyone else is running. Jesus is running to him while they're running from him. The leper decided to break the law, to break protocol, to break rank, to break the Jewish tradition and the Jewish law, and run to the only one who could do anything about his problem. Everyone else there and everyone in his life ran for their lives. Why? You don't want to get near a leper because if you get near him, you get leprosy and you create your own death sentence. But Jesus is not everyone else. He decided to also break Jewish tradition and rank and protocol and all that other junk and said, you know what? I got somebody running to me who's got a problem and I love people with problems. I love people that need a, a, a savior. I love people that need healing. I love people that need deliverance and help. I love anybody that runs to me. They run to me and all their mess. I'm going to take good care of them. Because look what happened here in Matthew 8, 3. Jesus put out his hand. Watch this. I love this. And touched him. Not only did Jesus get near to him, Jesus touched him. You didn't touch a leper. You get leprosy. You die. Jesus went straight to him, and he touched him. He wasn't worried about what this man had. I'm going to preach to somebody. You know why? Because you can't pollute Jesus. You can't contaminate Jesus. Notice that Jesus reached out and touched this man before he ever prayed or said a word. He was sending a message. You can't contaminate me with your sin. You can't mess with me with your sickness and disease. You can't somehow defile me. I am the son of the living God, he is saying, and I can take care of your problem. You can't pollute Jesus with your sin, with your sickness, with your disease, with your problems, with your circumstances, and you can't pollute him or, or somehow defile him with your darkness. He is light, and everywhere he goes, shines down on your life. There is nothing you can do to cause Jesus to run away or to say, ooh, I can't touch you because you are a mess. He is not afraid of you. He is not afraid of your choices. He is not afraid of your problems. I'm preaching to somebody. There is nothing in your life that will cause Jesus to distance himself from you. Woo. Yeah, if we ought to praise God. Nothing. Well, you don't know, Pastor, what I looked at. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I said. There is nothing that will cause him to distance himself from you. He is not afraid of getting contaminated by you. It's the opposite. 
If you get in the presence of Jesus, you will not infect him, but he will heal you. He will save you. He will deliver you. Whew, man, glory to God. Your problems don't scare him. He doesn't walk around the corner and see you and go, ah! What are we going to do? He didn't look to the Father and the angels in heaven and go, what are we going to do? Do you see the problems Dallas has? What are we going to do? He didn't do that. He's not threatened by your diagnosis. He doesn't care about your symptoms or your ways or your sin. Rather, he invites you to come closer when, when others would push you away. Have you, ever, have you ever felt anxiety over a situation you were just bound by and, and you prayed and all of a sudden the presence of God just whew, and that peace washes all over you and you say, oh man, God's got this. Whew. Come near his presence today. Point number two is Jesus is willing to heal you. Everybody say willing. I find there's a pandemic in the church today. Many people believe God can, not many believe he will. Jesus responds with five words, and the first two are him. The first two words are, I am. When Jesus or God says, I am, <laughs> he's telling you who he is. And you can fill in whatever adjectives and verbs you want after that. He is your answer, whatever it is you need today. It's a blank check. The word willing in the Greek means to have in mind, to intend, wish, desire, to like to do a thing. Watch this, to take delight in and have pleasure in. Jesus takes pleasure and great delight in healing you, delivering you, saving you, and helping you. He takes great delight in protecting you and providing for you. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like this? Hallelujah. One day God gave me a revelation of this. I was asking God to heal me, and I just was almost begging. And, 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 and the Lord just put in my spirit. He said, son, don't you realize I want to heal you more than you want to be healed? I'm the one that took the stripes. Why would I not want to heal you, and why would it not be my will to heal you if I took the disease and the pain and the sickness on my back with those stripes for all mankind? 1 Peter 2.24 says you were healed. The Word says you were. I'm here to preach to you today and tell you Jesus or I am is willing. He's willing to heal you of sickness or disease. He's willing right now to rid you of anxiety, fear, and worry. He is willing to provide for you and your family, to protect you and your family, to guide you, to lead you, to speak to you, to help you, to deliver you. My blessed Lord, Jesus is willing. Woo! Everybody shout, he is. Yes. That's present tense. I love that. You see, when God or Jesus says, I am, whatever word he says after that is legally binding forever. What does that mean? When Jesus said, I am willing, be cleansed, it wasn't just for that man, but for any person that would come in the history of mankind after him that would ask and believe for God to do it. What he said in the scriptures is valid for you and I today. Jesus is Willing, just shout that with me. Jesus is willing. Woo. He's willing to save, heal, and deliver. You know, so many Christians believe in how God healed somebody else back then. Well, of course you do. You see that it's true. Or they believe it can happen for someone else. They can believe for your healing right now. But somehow, there are too many in the church today that don't believe Jesus will heal them. They think they aren't worthy. They think they've done too much wrong, or it's for someone else. Or they think, I don't want to bother Jesus and weigh him down. I'm come to tell you Jesus is willing to heal you today. Mark 6, 5. Now, he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Leave this up for a second. Now, I've read this I don't know how many times in my life. And I've looked and looked at this scripture, and I thought, man, you know, that, 
Nazareth, they didn't believe. Their unbelief, and I'll show you the rest of the passage here in a moment. They didn't believe, you know. He couldn't do mighty works there, except for he laid his hands on a few people and healed a few sick people, but he really couldn't do anything mighty. Look at the scripture a different way. In the mind of God and Jesus, healing you is not a mighty work. He could do no mighty work except heal a few people. You see, what seems so big to us, Jesus says, that ain't a mighty work. If God healed three or four of you right now today and you had a testimony like Brenda, you'd leave this place and go berserk and we'd all go, wow, the mighty hand of God worked today. And God would sit in heaven and go, no, nah, that ain't no mighty work. That's just a few sick people. Is anybody hearing this? You're looking at me like I'm preaching the Koran right now. I come to tell you, he healed three or four or five of you today. In his mind, that's not a mighty work. That's what he said in the scriptures. Now, I don't know what a mighty work he considers a mighty work, but I'd like to see a not a mighty work today right now. Amen, if that's the case. Jesus said, I couldn't do mighty things. I just healed a few people. Well, for them people, it was mighty. But in his mind, it wasn't mighty. Is anybody hear what I'm saying? We think we're gonna, we think we're gonna weigh Jesus down and overwhelm him with our junk and our problems. But I want to tell you, raising the dead, healing you of cancer, restoring your heart, restoring your family, that is not a mighty work to him. That is nothing to the God who created the entire universe. Glory to God. We somehow think if we go to God with all of our problems that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, rubbing his temples, going, Father, can you get me some Xanax? I can't deal with Dallas's problems no more. He don't do that. Look at the rest of the passage, Mark 6, 4 through 6. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives in his own household, and he could do no miracle there. Where? In his hometown. I want you to catch this. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Remember, it's not a mighty work to him. And he wondered at their unbelief. Jesus was in his hometown, and they limited him. <laughs> Jesus had to go to strange places to do mighty works. He wanted to do them in his hometown. He wanted to touch his relatives and the friends and the kids he grew up with. But he had to go to strange places to do mighty works. How does that represent to you and I today? The church is his hometown. Is your unbelief causing Jesus to have to go heal someone in strange places when he wants to do it right here in his house? Are you limiting what Jesus can do here in our church? Are you limiting him today? Does he have to go to strange places to heal? Because I hear stories all the time of people getting, there's, in California, they're going laying hands on people in the morgues and they're rising up. They leave, listen, they're laying hands on people in morgues and they leave after their prayer party and about 30 minutes later, the mortician's there working, all of a sudden this dead guy rises up. I mean, you're talking about having a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, this, stuff, this is happening today. But my question is, why does Jesus have to leave his hometown, the church, to go do it elsewhere? And I'll tell you why. Because we don't believe. We will not limit God in what he can do in this church. I know a pastor that has campuses all over the state of Arkansas. And they go to little small towns in Arkansas, and they, they actually don't buy them. They rent a Dollar General store. Dollar Generals don't own their own stores. The Dollar General goes out of business. They go to the owner and they rent. You all have seen the Dollar General. You know what size it is. It's a small building with a small little teeny tiny parking lot. They're running three services, 300 a service. They're running 900 people out of a Dollar General. I want to tell you, we got more parking here than a Dollar General. We got bigger facilities than a Dollar General. Do not ever limit what God can do. I believe we can win 1,000 people to Christ and run 1,000 people right here in this church what we have. Somebody shout amen. Do not limit what God can do. God wants to save a thousand people around here, and we want to disciple them. Amen? One lady wasn't feeling well. She was, 
she was feeling her, she was losing her color, and her son said, look, you really need to go to the doctor. She went to the doctor, and on December 10th of this particular year that she went, they said, well, we found three tumors on your liver. One's the size of a softball, two are the size of walnuts. And it's metastatic cancer, and there is nothing we can do. The strongest chemo out there is not going to help save your life. You just need to say your goodbyes to your family and call it done. She went home and laid in the floor totally defeated, and she had this thought come to her mind. She thought, I'm going to get the Bible, and I'm going to stand on it. She stood on that Bible, and she said, I'm going to stand as a, as, as a symbolic thing that I am standing on the Word of God, that I am believing the Word is my bedrock, it is my, it is my foundation, it is my everything. She found 62 scriptures in the Bible on her healing, and she started quoting them every day, multiple times a day. Some people take medicine. She took 62 scriptures. Her December was miserable. They told her, in fact, you got three weeks to live. You need to get your house in order. She kept taking 62 scriptures multiple times a day. January rolled around. She started feeling a little better, a little bit stronger. February, she felt stronger and stronger. By March, she was feeling great, and all her color had returned. She didn't go back to the doctor for 10 years. She finally went back after 10 years, and they couldn't find a tumor. They couldn't find a trace of cancer. They said, lady, you're in perfect health. God is still a healing God. And that testimony was just given about two months in a church of a friend of mine's. I want to tell you, he is still a healing God. Why does it work? Because when you declare the word of God, it will not return void. No matter what you feel like, the word says you're healed. Amen. And that leads me to point number three, and that is this. Jesus will heal you. Everybody shout it. Everybody shout it again. Jesus will heal you. Jesus will heal you. Jesus will heal you. Bible says in Matthew 8, 3, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I, will, I am willing, be cleansed. And what's the next word say? Immediately. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Why? It was gone because God's word can't return void. You see, sometimes we think, well, one day my day will come. One day I'll be healed. Someday I'll be healed. But did you know, nowhere in the New Testament will you ever find Jesus saying anything to anybody that says, well, brother, it's not your time just yet. Well, it ain't your season just yet. He healed everybody immediately. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Everybody say, now faith. Look at the first two words there. Everybody say, now faith. now faith. Shout it one more time. Now faith. now faith. So many in the church believe for what God did in the past. They say, well, I have faith. I saw what he did in the past. Well, it doesn't take anything to believe for what has already happened. It's done. That's past tense faith. But many in the church will say, I have faith. God's going to heal me later this week. Oh, tomorrow is going to be my day. But did you know that's just hoping and wishing? There's no faith in that. That's future tense faith. But what Jesus is looking for in the house of God right now is now faith, present tense faith that says, God, I believe you can. I'm asking you to, and I want you to heal me immediately before I hit the back doors and get on the bus to go to my car from tennis courts. A young Pentecostal minister the 1930s had tuberculosis in both his lungs. He was hemorrhaging blood from both of them. Bed riddled, he was dying. Lived at his father-in-law's farm. Father-in-law was out in the fields one day. His wife and his mother-in-law were out back, and he said, God, if you'll just give me enough strength, just give me enough strength to make it a quarter mile down the road to some trees and bushes down there. And he had this thought, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to pray till God heals me, or I'm going to die. But either way, this is over. He mustered up the strength. He made it down to that thicket a quarter mile down the road, and it wouldn't have mattered if he hollered or not. He had no strength left. He was totally and completely wiped out. The devil came whispering in his ear, Oh, they're going to find your body when the buzzards lead them to you. You done messed up now. They don't know where you're at. You got no strength. You can't even holler. He said it wouldn't have mattered if he could holler because he couldn't, he couldn't have enough voice. 
And he told the devil, he said, well, devil, he said, that's right. I, I, that's what I came here to do. God's either going to heal me or I'm going to die right here. He laid flat on his back. And he started thinking. All the prayers had been prayed. All the prayer requests he had turned in. Hundreds of people, thousands of people prayed. Every healing evangelist in the 1930s laid hands on him, prayed for him. He said, if I calculate all that, it'd be hundreds and hundreds of hours of prayers. And he thought, you know, there's been enough prayer. He said, God, I ain't going to ask you for prayer no more uh, to heal me. I'm going to thank you that you've already done it. Because your word says I'm healed. I am already healed. So he said, you know what, God? I'm just going to praise you from now on. And he started with a whisper. all he could do. Praise, glory to God. And then after 10 minutes, he got enough strength where he could rest his elbows on the ground. He raised his hands. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Thank you for healing me. After 10 more minutes, he testified, I had enough strength to raise my hands up. He said, praise God. His voice a little louder. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Well, sometime between then and two hours, he said, within two hours, he was up on his feet shouting, glory to God. So loud, somebody heard him shouting seven miles away. He was healed and in bushes. I come to tell somebody, healing is yours today. <laughs> he is willing to heal you right now. I'm going to close with one more thought. We're going to pray. Jesus says I want to heal you today. He wants to totally restore your life. Never understood verse 4 until I started studying it. But it, it, it fits for where the message is. I'm almost done. Matthew 8, 4. Jesus said to him, I never understood this. See that you tell no one, go your I mean, to tell no one, you think you, you're going to shout to everybody. Go your way. Watch this. Show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And I always looked at it and I thought, why did Jesus do that? And when I started digging in and studying, here's what I found. It was the examination by the priest would be a witness to them that the person was cured of leprosy, watch this, and could be reinstituted back into society. If the priest did not corroborate the healing, he's still an outcast. Jesus loved this man so much. He said, not only do I want to heal you of your problem on the inside and outside, I want you back in the community. I want you back with your family. I'm going to restore your marriage. I'm going to restore your family. I'm going to put you back to work. I'm going to put you back in society. Listen to me. Go to the priest. They're going to see you're healed. They're going to announce you're clean, and everybody in society is going to welcome you back. That is what Jesus does. He doesn't just want to heal you today. He wants to restore every last aspect of your life. He wants to restore your marriage, your family, your finances, your your health, your insides, your spirit man, your soul man. He wants to restore everything about your life. Woo! Somebody say glory. I'm going to ask for the prayer team to come, the altar workers. You know who you are. I've trained you. And, and for those that were just meeting, we'll have some training for you as well. There's some anointing oil up here. Here's the deal. Ain't no Mickey Mousing around today. You believe Jesus can heal you right now. I said, you believe and you want some kind of restoration right now, immediately. I want you to come, find somebody right here. We're going to lay hands on you and pray. I'd like for everybody to stand to your feet, if you will, because uh, they're going to lead us in a worship song, but I want you to come. Come on. You want healing.